So hopefully, in order that not that many people drop or be that as it may, for the final, um, there will be some extra office hours after this talk. Which, does anybody recognize the mom fish behind here? So these are all the babies, and this is the mom slash dad fish in the background here. So our seminar in biology this week will be from Susie Wren, who's over at Reed College. We'll be talking about the mouth breeding chiclet fish, which are really cool, and they change sex and undergo rapid evolution, all kinds of really fascinating stuff. But if you can't make the seminar and you want to hear more about molecular biology, uh, there will be extra office hours, 1 PM over in SRTC, building previously known as Science Building 2, um, up on the fourth floor in the conference room there. So please um, feel free to come, if you, particularly if you can't make it today or I don't answer your questions today. There will be normal office hours today um, right after class right here. So with that, let's get started <coughs> on today's lecture, which is going to be mostly about post-transcriptional regulation, but let's get on with it and do our clicker questions. Um, except that I might actually want to start the clicker. That would help. Uh, you never know. Let's try again. Too much excitement about office hours. There we go. That looks a little better, or worse as the case may be. Uh, if toy, twin of eyeless, was deleted in a fruit fly, the fruit fly would have white eyes, no eyes, normal red eyes, or normal red eyes and eyes on its legs, um, or E, which seems to have disappeared. So it must not be E. Ten, <clears throat> five, <clears throat> okay, what do we think? Um, we think the fly would have no eyes, um, and that's a very good answer because eyeless, they always name the gene after the mutant of what you're missing. And so when you have eyeless, that means if you mutate the eyeless gene, then you don't have eyes. If you overexpress it, you get too many eyes. Uh, and so the <clears throat> appropriate answer here, I guess I probably should get up my clicker to actually choose the right answer, um, is in fact B. Where are we here? Again, if I could actually select it, that would help. Um, clearly, I spent too much time thinking about the NSF meeting the other day. Up. Oh. Ah. Maybe somebody stole my clicker, so I can't actually do the right answer here. That's all right. I can, <laughs> I can do that manually later. Don't worry. OK. Explain the question a little more. I just, I don't know if I'm understanding. Did you ever think that it's like, that's the thing that it would be wrong? OK, so I'm happy to go and explain basically the, the point here is that Whenever you have a name of a gene, which is created by geneticists, they will name it based on the phenotype of the mutant. So if you're missing a particular gene, that's going to be what the phenotype is. And so it's kind of bass backwards in terms of how these things work. Because if you're talking about, for instance, the white gene. So if I talk about the white gene here, if there had been a mutation in the white gene, then you would have white eyes. 
but the normal gene product of the white gene would be making red eyes. So it's the opposite of what the normal gene usually is doing. Yeah? So this is just, uh, is best explained writing out an insect algorithm? Do you know like, how to name this and what it is expressing? Is it just crossed out or the opposite thing of that? Which is it expressing? Is that it? OK. I'm not sure I quite follow, but I guess sort of the idea. So drawing out exactly what's happening here. And so um, in the case of Eyeless, um, the mutation in Eyeless is lacking eyes. And so the flip side of that is if you express the Eyeless now ectopically, which is what we talked about last time, you can end up expressing eyes in the wrong place. Does that make more sense? OK. So <clears throat> next question. Uh, maintenance of the lysogenic state in lambda bacteriophage is due to positive feedback loops, negative feedback loops, flip-flop switches, feed-forward loops, or both positive feedback loops and feed-forward loops. Ten, five, okay, so <clears throat> positive feedback loops an activator leading to expression of an activator. Negative feedback loops are repressors leading to repression of that original gene. Flip-flop switches are two regulators, negative regulators that are interacting with each other, repressing each other's genes, and feed-forward are two activators. So what's happening in the lysogenic state? It's an activator expressing its own gene. So it's a positive feedback loop, and it's a single activator. So A is correct. Why do we end up with C there? I don't know. So for the rest of the day today, um, we'll talk about totally boring, dull stuff, so you may as well just leave. <laughs> no, um, X inactivation, um, talk a little bit about epigenetics um, and post transcriptional regulation. Uh, by the way, uh, there will be a course evaluation, and at which point you can talk about clicker questions, and you can tell me I should have clicker questions right in the middle of class so that everybody doesn't leave at the beginning. As the case may be, yes. So um, <clears throat> that's again. That's you guys. The last class section will have about 15 minutes, so you can fill out your. In fact, they're online evaluations, so you can take a look at that. <clears throat> so um, again, I am interested in what people think about clickers and how to do them and all this process. So we'll talk a little bit about X inactivation. Um, X inactivation has a lot of implications for a bunch of different things that we've talked about already. So modifications of histones, modifications of DNA, but also what we're going to be talking about more later today or maybe on Friday having to do with long RNAs, so long non-coding RNAs or non-protein coding RNAs. A um, little bit about epigenetics. We've talked a little bit about epigenetics already, but the main thing here is just thinking about how the state of a cell, i.e. expression of a gene like the positive feedback loop that we just talked about for lambda regulation, um, is maintained from cell to cell as things move forward. And then we'll talk a little bit about post-transcriptional regulation. I doubt we'll get through all of that today. So start out a little bit with the X inactivation. This is pretty specific to mammals. Turns out that lots of sexual organisms have similar kinds of issues dealing with 
multiple copies of some chromosomes in one sex and not as many in other ones. Um, lots of different ways that this happens, but this is specific to what happens in mammals. Uh, the whole problem here, or advantage as the case may be, is that females all have two copies of the X chromosome that have a whole bunch of genes on them, and us wimpy males only have this tiny little Y chromosome that you know, encodes for the radiator gene and the TV remote gene and the dishwasher gene. Um, some great stuff. I'll post some of this online. Um, but <clears throat> basically, if you've got two copies that are active of the X chromosome, this is a real problem. You end up with twice as much of a whole bunch of gene products. And there are a number of genetic diseases where if you have problems with this inactivation process, um, there's huge, huge kinds of defects that happen. So there's this process called dosage compensation. Basically, if you've got too many copies of a particular chromosome, one of them gets shut down. How does the cell know that there are too many copies of one chromosome? It's just taking the ratio of the X chromosome to autosomes, and autosomes are all those other ones. And so if you have a one-to-one -one ratio right at the very beginning, that means your two Xs, because all the autosomes, of course, are going to be two as well. Um, if you don't, it's just one. And so early on in the embryo, this number gets measured, and we can talk about how that gets measured again offline. Uh, and one of the chromosomes in each of those thousand cells gets condensed, becomes a bar body. Um, for a long period of time, this was what people used to determine sexes of athletes that people weren't quite sure about, um, was just the presence of bar body, so an inactivated X chromosome. Of course, if you're XXY, that becomes a bit of an issue. But um, these inactivated chromosomes are highly compacted, and you can actually see them. Um, in interphase nuclei. And so that's a really quite easy way to tell if you're just given cells. Are these cells from a male or a female mammal? Got bar bodies, female, not, are going to be male. Uh, this is what's called facultative heterochromatin. What's facultative? Stebman talked about this like you know, months and months and months ago. What's facultative mean? What's the antonym of facultative as far as we're concerned? Or constitutive usually what we've talked about here. Um, so constitutive is always one kind of chromatin. Facultative is sometimes one kind of chromatin. So here, this does get reversed. So if you think about the germline of a female becoming eggs, those X chromosomes have to be reactivated later on. So it's not a permanent state where they're always shut down um, into heterochromatin. So it's a facultative heterochromatin process. Um, you see those, okay, the classic example is your calico cat with different coloration, which is there. Uh, and all females are mosaics because of this randomly selected X chromosome back here at about the thousand cell stage. Yeah? Yeah, so, so if, if that bar body is getting shut down, how is it recognized? Does it have to like, be something that's happening that's causing it to be shut Yeah, so the, the, the question basically is, is what happens to that bar body when a cell which is in the germline, which is eventually going to become an egg, gets decondensed and go through the process? Turns out it has to do with demethylation, basically reversing all the steps we're going to talk about um, right now. But it's very specific in germline cells. It only happens in those germline cells. And there are specific genes, again, like we talked about last time. You know, where they end up being in development will have the expression of those genes in those particular cells. So the germline, particularly the haploid cells, then those bar bodies have been decondensed. So again, just <clears throat> cartoon-wise, at about 1,000 cells um, during development, random cells will have one, either the paternal, which is this XP, or the maternal, XM, condensed, and then those get maintained, again, through an epigenetic process. Once you have bar bodies formed on the maternal chromosome in this set of cells, all of the offspring of this are going to have that state. Um, we didn't know how this happened until probably about 15 or 20 years ago. Um, so it's a relatively recent event, um, figuring out what's going on here. Because it turns out it has to do with transcription and the production of 
a long non-coding RNA. And so this is the so-called XIST RNA made from the X <coughs> inactivation center. It's a particular place in the X chromosome in one of the two chromosomes, and this is where the X autosome ratio um, gets figured out. That <coughs> gene is transcribed, makes some RNA, and that gene actually is expressed very highly, and this RNA basically goes and binds to the chromosome on which that RNA has been made. So it's really a guilt by association. If you, your XIST is being made on one chromosome, that's the chromosome which is going to get inactivated. So what seems to happen is this RNA is made, it gets moved, this is a hand over hand process. Um, in fact, you can see this just looking at chromosomes. If you look at the RNA during this X inactivation process, it spreads from the X inactivation centers to the rest of the chromosome. Um, this is not through a base pairing interaction um, because how are you going to have one RNA that's going to base pair to your whole chromosome? Um, so it's an RNA which is not functioning through a base pair interaction, um, does seem to interact with itself, which is probably how it spreads from one end of your chromosome, actually usually about the middle of the chromosome, to either end. So the first thing that happens is you have expression of this RNA. That <coughs> spreads to the rest of the chromosome. Then you remove acetyl groups from histones. So remember, histone acetyl transferases are very important for getting your transcriptional activation because it's neutralizing that positive charge. So you're allowing the <coughs> um, nucleosomes. So get rid of the acetyl groups. You're going to have more of the positive charges that you normally have, the lysines and arginines on your side chains, more compaction, methylation of histones. So sort of shutting them down even more. You switch out histones as an H2A, which gets switched, and then finally DNA is methylated. So we talked about methylation of DNA last time. This is really sort of the ultimate modification that happens to your DNA, whereby you shut down and compact everything. And it's not just the changes that happen to the DNA. They're also DNA, <coughs> well, the methylated DNA binding proteins which will also help to compact. And you can literally see that. Again, that's what the bar bodies are, is where all of these compactions take place. Once you have this process, you'll have, through at least the <coughs> transfer, again, you know, start methylating your histones. There'll be histone binding proteins that will methylate the histones next to that. So classic process that we've talked about before. But how these get passed along from generation to generation is this X inactivation center is curiously enough not compacted. And so any one which is still being activated, that's what gets passed along from generation to generation. So X inactivation, it's about a long non-coding RNA, and then all of the histone and DNA modifications that we've talked about so far. So it's a nice example of all these other kinds of things. So that brings <clears throat> me to talking briefly about the epigenetic mechanisms that we've talked about so far, this is not by any stretch of the imagination all of the epigenetic mechanisms. These are the major ones um, so far. The book splits them up into those that act in cis and those that act in trans. Cis, again, is right next to whatever change you've made, and trans is then basically diffusing through the cell or through the nucleus. So in cis, we talked about DNA methylation, so it's a methylated DNA. There's a binding protein that binds to that methylated DNA that stimulates the binding of a methylase, which will put on a methyl group onto your DNA, and the binding protein that stimulates the methylase, et cetera. Same thing is true for chromatin modification. You have modification of chromatin, our histone read-writer complexes, reads one modification, writes that same modification right next to it. So all of this is happening in cis. When you have one modification, it spreads throughout the rest of your chromosome. And you can also think about this in terms of X inactivation. So this is all happening one state. That state is maintained even after replication. On the other hand, these positive feedback loops that we talked about for lambda and other things, now you're expressing a particular protein. That particular protein 
diffuses. And when you have cell division, not so much replication, but cell division, those proteins are going to get distributed into the two new cells. And so those proteins then can, in each new cell, in the case of the positive feedback loop, turn on expression of that gene that's expressing that protein, which will in turn continue to cause expression of that gene, et cetera. So any kind of positive feedback loop is also going to be an epigenetic mechanism. So what happens, so the progeny of this cell depends on what happened back here at the very beginning. Turns out the same thing is true for protein aggregation. We haven't really talked about this, but again, it's a diffusible protein, which then can, once it gets into a new cell, catalytically cause the change of the state of the protein. And so this is what happens in a lot of neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, et cetera, as you have a misfolded protein. That misfolded protein catalyzes the misfolding of proteins which are already there. Um, but again, it's a process very similar to this positive feedback loop here, just a slightly different way of looking at it. So, yeah, sure. Yeah, so basically this is cell memory, exactly. So you know, this is you know, a way of thinking about so how the cell knows that something has happened to my grandmother, great-grandmother, et cetera. Yeah? So protein aggregation, how does that actually again make up like a prion disease or something like that? Exactly. So in this case, it's very much like a prion disease. Um, and there will be one, there will be a particular thing that happens here. It'll be some kind of signal that happens here. And it, that could be some kind of stress, could be oxidative damage. There are lots of, again, with the neurodegenerative disease, we don't know what that signal happens to be, <laughs> um, except in the cases where you have mad cow disease, where you consume one of these proteins, which leads to all of these other things that are happening after that. Really kind of a cascade, and again, kind of a positive feedback loop. Yeah, in the back. So um, positive feedback loop is the classic way of thinking about an epigenetic, because then when you split the cell, you're going to still have those. But if you've got enough of those of any in given protein, as soon as you split cells, you're going to have that protein being there. And so it can clearly lead to uh, inheritance of some kind of state of the cell. And so the idea here is that um, the whole idea of epigenetics is it's something which is being inherited, but it's not a change in the genetic material. And so that could be passing along proteins. It could be passing along activators, but it could be passing along repressors. Uh, it could be because when you replicate your DNA, you have the modified histones which are there. There are lots of different ways. But again, the idea here is that it's a heritable change that's not genetic. And these are just four examples of that. Okay, other questions on the, the epigenetics. I basically put this slide in my notes to provide a nice reminder on a bunch of stuff that's going to be on the final. Um, so what we've talked about in terms of transcriptional regulation has been how you get DNA binding to take place. And a lot of that has to do with alpha helices sticking into the major groove of DNA. That could be helix turn helix. It could be a number of other DNA binding motifs. And we talked a little bit about the methods on how you can detect this particular DNA binding. A little bit about regulation in bacteria. Repressors are the main thing there, but certainly there are activators as well. In eukaryotes, again, you've got activators and repressors, but you also have this annoying chromatin stuff, which makes it harder to get transcriptional activation, but it also means that you can really shut down transcription through chromatin modification. And so, yes, it's a disadvantage in terms of all the stuff that has to happen to get transcription to take place, but it's a big advantage because you don't get transcription when you don't want to have transcription taking place. And a great example is VAR bodies, the inactivated X chromosome. Uh, we looked at a few examples of combinatorial control, that you've got multiple activators, multiple repressors, all of those interacting at 
one particular promoter. In the bacteria, that was the lac operon, where you had repressors and activators interacting. Um, in eukaryotes, uh, the main thing that we talked about was even skipped in terms of how all of those uh, particular proteins are interacting with each other. Regulatory circuits, hopefully we've done that enough, I think, anyway. Uh, positive feedback loops, negative feedback loops, feed forward and flip-flop, those are only some of the particular circuits that we know of in happening in biological systems. Those are also the main ones, and those are the only ones I'll be asking you questions on, potentially. A um, little bit about epigenetics and DNA methylation, but again, we've gone over that um, now in a little bit more detail. Questions on this, other than what you'll have in office hours, I'm sure, as well. Okay, but this is a great place to start thinking about review on the materials that we have on the, on the final exam. Yeah? Um, maybe I'm missing part of the question. Is it only the No. So this is, yeah, so, but, you know, DNA binding, this is stuff which is, will be since the last midterm. So yes, no, the final, I'll repeat that again, probably important, important information here. Um, the final is not cumulative per se, i.e., I'm not going to go back and pull out questions from the first couple of midterms and say, hey, you guys did really badly on that one. I'm going to dot, dot, dot you again <laughs> with that same question. Um, no, but at the same time, I will assume some of the knowledge that you've had from before in the questions that come up this time. So it's not a, you know, per se cumulative, but um, there may be some things that will give us, oh, yeah. So I, hopefully you will have not completely forgotten the material that we had on the first two exams. Okay, so <clears throat> let's move away from transcriptional regulation. Oh, I think it's so wonderful. Again, I spent six years of my life doing this. Um, but that's by no means the whole story. Um, and this is partly why we, when we you know, talked about gene regulation, right at the beginning of this section after the second midterm, uh, mentioned that it's not just about transcription. Transcription is going to be your most efficient way of getting gene regulation because you're not going to be making all of the RNA and going on to translation, et cetera. But the fact that you've got all of these extra steps gives cells the possibility of regulating at lots of different steps. And so most people talk about this as post-transcriptional regulation. I like to think this is post-transcriptional initiation regulation because, as we talked about before, a lot of these processes happen while you're making the messenger RNA. And so all of these processes, basically, before you get out of the nucleus, are happening kind of while the RNA is being made. So I like to think of this as post-transcriptional initiation regulation. We've, all the regulation we've talked about so far is basically starting transcription. And once they've started transcription, we'll assume that that's become a messenger RNA and get translated. But that's not true. A um, number of different processes can happen that will not lead to finally getting protein synthesis. All this stuff happening here in the nucleus, a uh, process called attenuation, which is where you stop transcribing sooner than you otherwise would. Lots of modification of capping and splicing. In a few cases, even RNA editing, which is changing the sequence of the RNA after it's been transcribed. Um, turns out this is also a really good way to protect against virus infection. And then just regulation of getting out of the nucleus. You know, this whole process here, you're never going to get a protein until your RNA actually gets out of the nucleus because as far as we know, people argue about this, um, there are no active ribosomes in the nucleus. So you're only going to get translation into protein um, out here in the cytoplasm. A lot of post-transcriptional regulation is at the level of protein synthesis, so translation. Um, all the different processes which happen in terms of translation, how you go from your messenger RNA to protein, and a lot of that can be regulated. Not surprisingly, a lot of it's also regulated at the initiation step, because again, the sooner you do that, the more efficient it's actually going to be. Um, and just the amount of RNA that's around um, also leads a lot to how much protein you finally end up making. Um, so we'll talk about all of these different steps um, as we move through here. Start out with um, attenuation. This is a process also known as riboswitches. But all that attenuation is is 
terminating transcription sooner than you were expecting to. You may notice this kind of funky squiggle that I put on here. Um, why do you think I put a funky squiggle on here and deleted it over here? So what's this funky little squiggle here supposed to represent? So it's the C terminal domain of RNA polymerase II. Um, this particular case is actually from bacteria. So um, that's why they shouldn't have this um, in here. And I, I wrote a letter to the publishers of the book. So, uh, <clears throat> But the idea is you do have attenuation that happens in eukaryotic systems. There are few, very few actually riboswitches that you find in eukaryotes. Um, the vast majority are present in bacteria. But what a riboswitch is, is a secondary structure that forms in RNA. And that secondary structure is also called an aptamer. And what it does is it will interact with other things. And in this particular case, this RNA structure interacts with guanine. And when it interacts with guanine, it changes the secondary structure of this aptamer. What that change in secondary structure does is it gives you a transcription terminator. And if you remember, again, this is why having a CTD on this polymerase is very confusing. Um, this is a classic bacterial transcription terminator. It's a hairpin loop structure with a stretch of U's next to it. So if you have guanine interaction here, you'll form a secondary structure in your RNA that gives you a transcription terminator. If, on the other hand, you don't have guanine around, you don't form a transcriptional terminator, and the RNA polymerase will continue. So attenuation, again, all this is is having a termination point or not having a termination point that happens too soon. So attenuation, just an early process. Um, one of the really cool things about this is you don't even need any proteins for this, at least not any regulatory proteins. Of course, the RNA polymerase is a protein. Uh, and so people think this may be how some of the very early regulation in life on our planet originated, just in the presence of RNA. Um, and so RNA can bind to lots of these different things. So that's attenuation. What next? Okay, you make your messenger RNA. Now it gets spliced into different pieces. This is basically a review of what we talked about in terms of alternative splicing before. Uh, alternative splicing is quite common, but it's usually regulated. In, very often, it'll be one cell will have one kind of splicing, a different cell will have a different kind of splicing. About 5% of the messenger RNAs in yeast are differentially spliced, about 75% in human are differentially spliced. There are two kinds of regulation. Surprise, surprise, should seem really familiar back to what we're talking about in terms of transcriptional regulation. Negative regulation, positive regulation. Negative is blocking the activity of something, in this case, the spliceosome. Positive is stimulating something which is going on there. And this gets to, we talked about the splice sites. Splice sites are consensus sequences or not consensus sequences. If they're very close to the consensus sequence, they're going to bind to U1, U2, U2AF very well. You'll get good splicing that happens there. On the other hand, if you have not very similar sequences that are going to base pair to U1, U2, you want to stimulate those kind of interactions. So a negative regulator is literally just going to block one of the splice sites usually through a specific RNA protein interaction. Once you've blocked these normal splice sites, you end up with splice sites that are otherwise not used, or you can stimulate the use of these weaker splice sites. And because of this, of course, it's the example that we had before, you can have one gene and potentially many, 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 in this particular case, 38,016, um, different possibilities. But usually you have Constitutive splicing, most of your exons are going to be used in most of the final RNAs, and just a few of them are going to be slightly different. Probably the best understood of these, yeah? I was, I was just trying to figure out, so why are the strong blocking and these weak? Right, so if you have a negative regulator of splicing, and we'll talk about this in just a second as an example, 
but a negative regulator of splicing is now going to bind to an otherwise strong site that will be used for splicing, block that being used, if that's blocked, then since splicing is always happening in a co-transcriptional process, if you've blocked one splice site, you're likely to use the next one right next to it. And that could be one which otherwise would not be used because the strong splice site is being used. Okay, so let's look at an example of this. Um, it turns out the best known example of this has to do with sex determination, but not sex determination in humans, but sex determination in fruit flies which are actually XXYY, just to make things even more interesting and confusing. Uh, but still, flies determine what sex they're going to be based on the X chromosome to autosome ratio as well. Again, slightly different numbers as far as that's concerned. And as a quick aside, um, back in the late dark ages when I was doing my PhD, uh, the, one of the labs that was in the same building as mine was also working on this whole process. And so we'd have our little get-togethers after seminar speakers, and there'd be fruit and then various different fruit flies flying around, and, and people go, oh, that's one of mine. It's a sex comb reduced, you know. <laughs> oh, no, no, that one's my curly wing. Curly wing, that was one of my flies. So, yeah, you had, when you work with fly geneticists, things get a little weird sometimes. But um, <clears throat> the um, whole process of fly sex determination has to do with this one particular gene um, called Sex Lethal. There's a 60-page manuscript that I'd be more than happy to share with you if you like, um, written by the guy whose lab was downstairs in the same building that I was in. Um, so Sex Lethal is a repressor of splicing. So it's a negative regulator of splicing. If you have an X to autosome ratio of 0.5, that means in the case of the fruit fly, you're male, then <clears throat> you won't produce the sex lethal gene, and this splice site will happen. And this is, in fact, the sex lethal gene itself. So it's a self-regulating gene. Um, here, if you don't have this splicing repressor, then you make a non-functional protein. So this will be a negative feedback loop. So non-functional protein, never going to happen. On the other hand, if your extra autosome ratio is 1, then the splice site here is blocked. That leads to a functional sex lethal protein, which provides this feedback loop. So you end up with more and more and more of this sex lethal protein. So sex lethal repressor of splicing. And again, what it does is it will block the normal splice site, which would happen in the absence of the splicing repressor. Then. This sex lethal protein, it's a protein, so once it's produced, it can also diffuse and act on other genes. And in this case, it's a RNA binding protein that's interacting with RNAs. Um, also binds to the transformer gene, the transformer, I should say the transformer transcript. Again, in a very similar way, normal splicing happens here. This is a nice binding site for U2. If this is now blocked because of the sex lethal protein. Now you make a <clears throat> functional transformer protein. And getting back to you know, this whole process, the Drosophila genesis, what do they do? They name things based on what the mutant phenotype is. So if you've knocked out the sex lethal gene, one particular sex, and I'll let you guess which one it is, is dead. Um, and the transformer gene, you knock out the transformer gene, that will transform something that otherwise would be male to female and female to male. So transformer, this transformer <clears throat> gene product is an activator now of splicing. The activator of splicing leads to a variation in a double sex protein. So again, give you one guess what happens if you have a mutant in double sex who end up with flies that are male and female, at least are displaying male and female characteristics. And in fact, there are a whole bunch of these you know, on the fruit display in Berkeley in the mid-90s. Um, so <clears throat> that was the sex combs reduced, et cetera. So um, this is a transcriptional repressor. So the transcriptional repressor in a male is going to repress 
female genes, and in a female it's going to repress male genes. And how does it know that it's male versus female? Well, that's because of this splicing that takes place. And splicing, again, just changes part of your protein. So it's a, this part, the N-terminus, of both the male-specific and the female-specific is the same, transcriptional repressor. What it binds to is now going to be different because of different splicing that takes place. So here, transformer proteins and activator splicing will cause splicing to happen somewhere where you would not have splicing taking place here. That gives you a different C-terminus of the protein from what you have here. I give you one guess what's encoded for in that C-terminus. Transcriptional repressors are going to do what? They're not co-repressors, they're repressors. It's Wednesday morning. I haven't had my coffee yet. What do transcriptional regulators do? And how do they regulate transcription? <laughs> Bind to DNA. So where do you think the DNA binding motifs in these proteins are, DNA binding domains? At the C terminus of the proteins. Wow. <laughs> you did, yes. <laughs> sort of the process. So yes, these C termini are going to be important for what specific sequences they're going to bind to. Um, and that's all dependent on the splicing that's taken place um, beforehand. Yeah? So we, all of these have to work together to come to a, you know, a male and a female. Yeah, so the question here is that you know, do all of these genes have to work together in order to come to that decision about male or female? Yes. So it's that whole process. You only finally make the decision when you have figured out how the double sex protein is being spliced. And so if you don't have the double sex protein and you're mutant, you're not going to repress the male specific genes and you're not going to repress the female specific genes. And so this process is all repression of the male or female specific genes. If you're male, you repress the female specific. If you're female, you repress the male specific genes. Yeah, so a whole cascade process in how this works. So that's splicing. We didn't talk about capping. Capping's regulated too. Again, whole fun and interesting story. Um, now we'll talk about regulated tailing, or mRNA cleavage process. So we talked a lot about, or maybe not enough about, the <clears throat> cleavage stimulation factor, CSTF, one of those wonderful acronyms that we've had before. Uh, <clears throat> that is stimulating cleavage that happens through the endonucleases that we haven't talked about. Um, again, co-transcriptionally. So as you're making your messenger RNA, if you have the PSF and CSTF binding to your RNA, you'll get cleavage and poly A tail formation. Turns out that in the <clears throat> expression of genes for antibodies, you can have various different states of stimulation of B cells. The Early, early and non-stimulated and stimulated B cells. What happens there is through a combination of various different signals and transcription and translation, some cases you'll have low amounts of CSTF and other cases where you've actually stimulated antibody production, stimulated these B cells, you have high amounts of CSTF. What does that do for you? What it does is low CSTF, you basically... <clears throat> miss this early stop codon. Why is that? Well, that's because there's a <clears throat> splice event that normally will take out this particular stop codon. But if you have high CSTF, you're going to stimulate cleavage of this messenger RNA before it has a chance to do all of its splicing. And so if you cleave here, you're going to have your poly A tail that forms here. You're never going to be able to do splicing that takes place here. So high CSTF, you cut your messenger RNA right here. You don't have splicing that takes place. Low CSTF, you have another chance to cut here. Splicing happens first. 
you end up with a much longer messenger RNA and again also longer protein. So what you end up with here are changes again in the C terminus of your protein. If you think about alternative splicing, where are you going to get the changes happening? It's always going to be in the C terminus. It's not going to be the N terminus because those are the first exons that you get there. So the C terminus here, instead of being different in terms of DNA binding, it's now hydrophobic or hydrophilic. If you think about this in terms of the B cells, this one's going to be bound to the cell. This one's going to be secreted. And this is just another way of looking at it. I preferred this image from the fourth edition rather than the edition from the sixth edition. But it's exactly the same thing. Here, low <coughs> CSTF, end up with splicing. High CSTF, you don't. Splicing, you end up with a hydrophobic region, no splicing, so, um, hydrophilic, and secreted antibodies. So activated B cells, non-activated B cells. Non-activated B cells, the antibodies are associated with the membrane. Activated, they're being secreted, go off through your circulatory system, bind to antigens, and lead to all of the wonderful things that happen with the rest of the immune system. So we talked about tailing. We've talked about splicing. And in fact, the splicing and tailing are kind of connected to each other, having to do with the relative amounts of these. Then some of the weirdest thing that happens in terms of messenger RNAs is what's called RNA editing. Uh, usually you think, hey, you look at your DNA sequence, you know what the protein's going to be made because you know the genetic code. And then you look at some of the things that are made and you go, wait a minute, how did that happen? How did we end up with this protein even though we know what the gene is that's encoding it? Um, Turns out that there are a number of cases where after transcription takes place, that RNA gets modified. Most of the time, that's going to be a chemical modification. Sometimes it will actually be stimulating the addition of some extra nucleotides. Fortunately, as far as we're concerned, um, most of the time, this process doesn't happen. Extra uracils, which are being incorporated, much more often what happens in mammals is you have deamination that takes place. Either adenine deamination, which is this adam adenine deamination enzyme, binds to a specific structure in your RNA. You'll notice here it's a double-stranded RNA and will modify this adenine. And deamination, as we talked about way back when we talked about tRNAs, deamination of A leads to I. Why is that so important? Because I can base pair with a whole bunch of other things. It's not always going to be A's base pairing with, with U's. Uh, turns out if you're missing this gene, your brain doesn't develop it properly. So some of this particular modification taking place here has to do with some things that we probably think are rather important. So it's an adenine deaminase that acts on RNA. Um, on the other hand, APOBEC, it's an absolutely horrible acronym, which is why people always call it APOBEC. And I literally had to write down what it is here, because otherwise I would forget. It's an apolipoprotein B mRNA editing enzyme catalytic polypeptide-like. Uh, I'll give you APOBEC, don't worry. <laughs> So ApoBex are also deaminases. The ApoBex deaminase is a cytidine deaminase. So what happens when you take cytidine and deaminate it? Your DNA damage machinery knows to recognize use. Exactly. Only in this case, it's acting on RNA rather than on DNA. If it acts on DNA, then you've got a DU and your uracil DNA glycosylase, so you can get rid of it. In RNA, it changes the coding sequence. So it turns out that these ApoBex are really important for protecting against infection, particularly by retroviruses like HIV. So one of the major ways that we protect ourselves against retroviruses is by the production of these ApoBex genes, which are modifying the RNA that comes in with RNA viruses. But it turns out that there are also specific RNA editing that has to take place in some of these messenger RNAs. And this is the case here. This is, in fact, the apolipoprotein B gene, <laughs> which has that modification that takes place. 
in some cases, again, if you have the presence of the apobac gene, then it will modify your RNA. In the absence of the apobac gene, it won't modify the RNA. So here, apolipoprotein B <clears throat> um, will be modified. You end up with the UAA, stop codon, short protein. In the absence of apobec, normal translation takes place, and you have a liver-specific protein. So this is you know, RNA modification happens, important for brain development, important for expression of certain different genes, but also very important for protection against um, RNA virus infection. So RNA editing, I haven't talked about capping, but splicing, tailing. What happens next? RNA export. So RNA export is also highly regulated, best understood, interestingly enough, in that virus that APOBEC deals with really quite well. Uh, HIV-1. Lots of RNA viruses have problems, all kinds of different problems, it's above and beyond making us sick. But what happens in HIV and a lot of RNA viruses is they have massive amounts of splicing that take place. And that's shown up here at the top. So the RNA for particularly HIV, but pretty much any retrovirus, undergoes huge amounts of splicing. So all of the green things up the top here re are, represent different proteins that are being made from this one RNA that's made as the viral genome. This one RNA, it's a retrovirus that's being made by RNA polymerase II in the nucleus. So splicing to make all these proteins is fine and well and good. The problem is, if you want to have an infective virus, you have to have this whole RNA taken out into the cytoplasm and then eventually escape from the cell. So there has to be some way of regulating what gets transported out of the nucleus. The way that happens is through this protein called REV. You notice here it's present as two exons. So that gets spliced together. The REV protein itself is translated, re-imported back into the nucleus, and then this REV protein binds to a E. What are E's? E's are elements, which are going to be sequences, right? So the REV response element, the RRE, so sequence in the RNA that the REV protein is going to bind to, once it's bound, it will allow the nuclear export of the whole genome of the RNA, as opposed to only the spliced pieces that are happening. And that has to do with the fact that we've got a nuclear export signal on this protein, and it will pull out everything that's associated with it. But this is smart, again, to totally over-anthropomorphize the virus, because this is only going to happen after you've had splicing and production of the other proteins that you have in your virus. Because this is only going to happen after you have splicing, because it's in a spliced part of your transcript, and the proteins are being produced. So it's a way of making sure that you only have export of the whole RNA after you've been producing the proteins, which are what you need to be making the rest of the virus. Um, turns out that there are other ways that nuclear export is regulated too, mostly, again, having to do with binding proteins that will bind to an RNA and then basically pull that RNA out with them as they're being exported from the nucleus. But again, it's best understood for HIV and some other retroviruses. So once we've got that RNA out of the nucleus, now we want or don't want to translate that particular messenger RNA. Another way you can regulate how much translation takes place is by putting RNA in a particular place. You remember our gradients of bicoid and hunchback? Any idea how those gradients get formed? Turns out it has to do with where the RNA gets put. So the <clears throat> RNA for the bicoid protein gets localized to the anterior end of the cell, which is going to end up producing that gradient that you have in the embryo. How does that happen? It's due to 
proteins that are going to associate with the 3 prime untranslated region, UTR. Um, the untranslated region is what's the part of the RNA which is after the stop codon, but before you have your poly A tail. And there are a number of proteins that associate there. We'll see RNAs that associate there on Friday. That 3 prime UTR is really important for getting these RNAs either to localize directly in one place, and in fact you can see that here. These are RNAs with a 3 prime UTR that are associated very closely with these blue cells at one end. If you take off this 3 prime UTR, then look for the RNA. It's spread out all throughout this tissue here. Lots of different ways that these guys can be moved. You can, also, you can have them bound to proteins that will associate with the cytoskeleton. That's what's shown here. They could just be a binding site. This is, in fact, what happens with bicoid. Just bind at one place. They're made all over the embryo, all over the cell, but are just held in one place. Or you can also have degradation that takes place of these specific, specific RNAs. We'll talk about degradation um, a lot more as we move along here. But if you've got your messenger RNAs localized to a specific place, what happens with these messenger RNAs once they're out in the cytoplasm? You want to translate them. How do you translate? You need to get your translational machinery to either the cap or the start codon. So how do you regulate translation, and particularly translational initiation? In bacteria, it's all about the start codon and shine delgarno So shine delgarno sequence, again, is a sequence in your RNA that's going to interact with the small subunit of the ribosome. So if you've blocked that interaction, you're never going to get translation to take place. These are four different examples on how you can do that. Uh, my favorite is this one right here, not just because I have a buddy who works on it. Um, this is what are called RNA thermometers. So in this case, you have a RNA secondary structure that will form that contains the Charn de Garno sequence AUG in it. And just by heating up the cell, what happens is these structures come apart. And we already talked about what happens with DNA hybridization, just heating up your RNA. You go through a transition point. Um, and just that increased temperature will allow the AUG to be exposed, the Charing Dalgarno sequence. You have association of the ribosome. You get translation. So RNA thermometers, really cool systems. You just put a specific RNA with specific sequence in it, forms a specific structure at one temperature, change the temperature, it opens up, you get translation. Totally cool, really simple process which is going on there. Uh, you also have riboswitches. So we talked about the riboswitch for transcriptional regulation where you form terminators. You can also have very similar riboswitches which will form and make secondary structures which will block Schein-Dalgarno interactions and interactions with AUGs. So it's an RNA structure which will, in the presence of, in this case, a small molecule, will block AUG formation or AUG availability, I should say, for the small subunit of the ribosome, or vice versa. You could have a small molecule that interacts here with your RNA aptamer. Again, RNA aptamer is a sequence of RNA that will form a particular structure uh, that will then cause translation to take place. Some cases you'll have specific proteins that are involved in shutting down translation, and we'll see this a little bit later on when we talk about translational regulation in eukaryotic systems. Translation repression protein will bind to usually some kind of secondary structure in your RNA and block kind of activity. The other thing that we found more and more of recently is the presence of these small RNAs. So small RNAs is regulatory sequences. One of the things that RNAs do really, really well is they base pair with things. And so you can have a RNA which can base pair to your shine delgarno sequence as long as it's stronger than the interaction of the small subunit of the ribosome the presence of these so-called anti-sense RNAs, because the sense RNA is where you've got your AUG, where you'd be making your protein, the anti-sense RNA can actually bind as a complement to that sequence and block any kind of ribosome interaction. 
So antisense RNA can block translation from taking place. And we'll see that in eukaryotic systems, there's other kinds of antisense RNA that lead to regulation. So that's what's going on in bacteria. Antisense, protein binding, the thermometers, which I think are the actually hottest rather than coolest, probably the better way of talking about it, uh, and riboswitches, which are changing secondary structures. Yeah? Could easily be some other kind of molecule. So the small molecule that we're talking about here for the riboswitches, um, it could well be. And so the example we talked about for transcriptional attenuation was binding to guanine, which is one of the purines. And it turns out the gene that's being regulated by this riboswitch is guanine biosynthetic genes. So in the presence of guanine, you don't need to make them. Um, you could have a very similar kind of thing going on here. Wouldn't necessarily have to be a protein. It's just whatever this messenger RNA would be producing, um, you want to shut that down in some way. And usually it'd be some kind of product that you'll be getting from it. It's almost like a made of two batches, so it might just get a lot of guanine and then you're not going to um, have that interact with the riboswitch. Yeah, so um, you're exactly, I'm just going to uh, repeat this here, but the idea there is it's a feedback loop where it's going to be a negative feedback because you don't want to be making the proteins that you need to make whatever small molecule it is at the end. And so it's a lot like the tryptophan repressor we talked about from the transcriptional point of view. That's now a protein which is binding. Here you just have an RNA which is binding to it. It's a very similar kind of process. And that can happen at the transcriptional level. We lead to attenuation, premature termination, or here blocking translational initiation. So two different ways of doing basically the same thing. Okay, just want to finish up talking a little bit about some general translational regulation now that's happening in eukaryotic systems. How do we know it's a eukaryotic system? Because of our cute little small case E here uh, next to our initiation factor. So initiation factor means what? What are we talking about now? Translation. IFs, EFs, and RFs. We're all talking about translation here. So what happens with EIF2? EIF2 is the GTPase that binds to the initiator tRNA and brings it into the ribosome as that small subunit is scanning along and trying to find the AUG to start from after it moves from the cap. So when you have found that right place, you have GTP hydrolysis and you go to GDP and the whole process happens again. But the key to this is that you also have to have an extra protein called this nucleotide exchange factor. And all this nucleotide exchange factor does is take your inactive EIF2, which is bound to GDP, and put a GTP onto it. Pretty straightforward process, but you've got to take out the GDP and put in the GTP. Uh, this has to happen so you can get translational initiation to take place. However, you can block translational initiation by blocking the interaction of these two proteins with each other. And actually, it's really blocking the activity of this second protein. Uh, so if you have phosphorylation, you're not going to get active EIF2. If you don't have active EIF2, you're not going to get translational initiation taking place. Viruses, turns out um, many viral protection mechanisms that we'll talk about next term in virology. Uh, one way to protect against a virus infection is to actually phosphorylate EIF2 because all viruses are dependent upon cellular translation. If you block cellular translation, you're going to block virus translation as well. You also block your own translation, which is a different issue. Um, but that's all that's happening. You're blocking this process where you're making um, G active GTP. And in a lot of cells, this actually is what happens too. Um, if you're in the quiescent stage of the cell cycle, the G0 cycle, a lot of your EIF2 is phosphorylated. And in that phosphorylated state, stays an inactive, so you're not going to be starting translation. You remember, translation of the replication, transcription, translation, the most energy-demanding process is that translation process. 
So it's a way of shutting things down. Also happens under stressful conditions. So stress conditions of a cell shut down translation. Why are you shutting down translation? Because that's what requires all of the energy in the process here. Talk a little bit more about translational regulation on Friday and finish up with gene regulation at that point.